It's December 10th, 1962, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Frank Sinatra Jr. lived his whole life in his famous father's shadow, and even his kidnapping ended up being subsumed to the larger story of Frank Sinatra Sr. agreeing to pay a $240,000 ransom, as he did on this day, for the release of his then 19-year-old son, who had been the victim of a pretty amateurish, but probably quite frightening, kidnapping. But for an amateurish kidnapping, actually quite a lot of thought went into it by the chap who was the kind of mastermind, if you can credit him with being a mastermind. His name was Barry Keenan. The story goes that he'd made a lot of money in real estate and the stock market in his very young life. He was only in his early 20s. But then he had this car accident that really knocked him around and left him both addicted to painkilling drugs and then all Also, to subsidize his addiction, he then came up with this kind of madcap plan to make off with the child of one of his parents' friends. So Frank Sinatra Jr. was at the time just starting his own musical career. He was performing at Harrow's Club Lodge in Lake Tahoe. Barry and his accomplice, Joe Amsler, who was also 23, they got access to the hotel by pretending to deliver a package... They had pistols in their pocket to threaten Frank Sinatra Jr., but they hadn't counted on the presence of John Foss, his mate who was his trumpet player, who was having dinner with him at the time. So they just decided instantaneously to strap him to a chair. Yeah, they (laughs) tied him up with medical tape and then they escorted Frank Jr. out at gunpoint. And at this point, Barry Keenan realised that he'd left his gun upstairs in the dressing room. So he went back up to the dressing room and this guy had just obviously just taken this medical tape off. And so he sort of said... Mm, you know, I don't have time to tie you back up, but don't leave here for 10 minutes. And then, of course, as soon as he left, the trumpeter escaped very quickly and raised the alarm. And so all these roadblocks were instantly set up to look out for these two assailants and Sinatra Jr. Luckily for the kidnappers, Frank Sinatra Jr. was a really a model captive. He went very quietly. He agreed to pretend to just be a friend of theirs. They even said, will you drink some whiskey and pills so it looks like you're drunk if anyone stops us? And he was like, OK. He was 19 and his dad was Frank Sinatra. So I guess he was thinking two things. One, I'm scared. Two, dad is going to buy me out of it. (laughs) Yeah, and three, they have a gun, or at least they had a gun for a little bit before they left it up in the hotel room and had to go get it again. They also used each other's real names, by the way, in front of the third party that they tied to the chair. So he already had some important information to sell the police. (laughs) But then they managed to sail through at least one of these checkpoints by... Pretty much doing what what Rebecca just described, that they said that Frank Sinatra Jr. was their mate and he was drunk and he went with it and the police waved them through. I don't know what the police were told they should be looking for. Yes, because these were roadblocks that were erected specifically to prevent the kidnap of Frank Sinatra Jr. Yeah, look out for Frank Sinatra Jr. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Keenan had actually tried to kidnap him on two previous occasions, once in Arizona, which was foiled. And then he was going to kidnap him in Los Angeles because there was this big college football game going on. And one of the sides playing was Keenan's university. So he was like, I'll kidnap him and then I'll come back and go to the game and everyone will remember that I was at the game. So no one will know it was me. But on the actual day where it was meant to happen, JFK was assassinated. So the game was cancelled, everything was in total uproar, and he had to let Frank Jr. slip away again. So as part of the alarm being raised, the FBI are already tapping the calls when the inevitable accomplice calls Frank Sinatra Sr., and asks for some money in exchange for his son. So this third conspirator was a guy called John Irwin. He'd once dated Keenan's mum. I'm, I'm not quite sure how he was uh, pulled back into it. But so he contacted <laughs> Frank Sr. to demand exactly $240,000. Frank picked up the phone. His opening gambit was, I'll pay you a million dollars to free my son. And Irwin's response <laughs> was, Oh, we don't need a million dollars, actually. I was calling for 240000 <laughs> which is kind of a signal to the FBI that these guys are maybe not that experienced. <laughs> 
Just as a little aside, there was a film that was ultimately made of this whole thing called Stealing Sinatra that generally got scathing reviews, but there was a quite funny scene about this exact moment where William H. Macy as the kidnapper, John, gets onto the phone and as Sinatra curses him out, he covers the mouthpiece and whispers wounded, he's mean, <laughs> which does sound like a, a sort of perfect encapsulation of the slapstick nature of this kidnapping. This figure of $240,000, the reason that they they were so firm about it was that it came from Keenan's 27 page ring binder of detailed planning that was the exact amount that he had calculated that he would need to make all the investments he wanted to make the booklet also included a section on possible upsides for the Sinatra family <laughs> uh, including that it would bring them closer together and it might take attention away from a money laundering investigation that was involving Frank Sinatra senior at the time So the FBI advised Sinatra Sr. to pay the ransom of 240000 in cash, but the FBI had recorded the money's serial numbers. Yes, so the money was dropped off as prearranged at a gas station. Keenan and Amslet picked it up, while Irwin was kind of confused about what to do, and he just sort of let Sinatra Jr. go. He wandered around for a while until he found a security guard who drove him to his mother's house. And then the kidnappers were supposed to go and lie low. However, on the way to go and do that, John Irwin managed to stop at his brother's house and boast about his involvement in this, of course, now nationwide story. And the brother just tipped off the FBI. And within a couple of days, all three of them had been arrested and most of the ransom money had been recovered. So it did get to court. And the line that the defence team came up with, and I suppose this was the best defence they had, really, because we've touched on what amateur hour this was. But I mean, they'd left fingerprints on the tape that they'd used to take the guy to the chair The FBI had recordings of them agreeing to the ransom. The police had also found the disguises that they'd left behind in their hotel room opposite the casino, which they forgot to check out of. (laughs) And by the way, the disguises were (laughs) moustaches. Like, funny Groucho one. They're like, it's me, I've come to deliver a parcel. (laughs) And obviously they'd been caught with most of the money. Yes. So all they had really to go on was, oh, the Sinatras were involved in it. The mud sort of stuck with Frank Jr. for his whole life afterwards Mm. that he would be interested in the publicity somehow of this kidnapping scheme because his career had never matched his father's. And it's so interesting because it's like from this distance, it's obvious that his career never matched his father's because he wasn't Frank Sinatra. I mean, he had, like, the voice of the century. Like, of course he wasn't Frank Sinatra. And if anything, yeah. you sort of think, like, the, the fault for that particular psychological time bomb was on Frank. Like, why name your son Frank Sinatra Jr.? That's going to be a hard thing to live up to if you go into music, isn't it? But, of course, you know, he wasn't Frank Sinatra. He wasn't as famous as Frank Sinatra Sr. So it sort of stuck this idea that, like, he'd try and leverage himself some extra fame if he wanted a career in music, and that's why he'd set this up but it was obviously completely untrue well and the reason that that line of argument was able to hold some water in the absence of any evidence proving it was true was that there was a very unusual celebrity witness Dean Torrance of the surf rock duo Jan and Dean probably best remember now for Surf City USA he was called in to testify because he was Barry Keenan's best friend and he actually shared a safety deposit box with him which some of the money and a confession note that Keenan had written for his parents was found in and initially Dean denied all knowledge of the scheme but then he came back into court you turned and admitted that he knew all about the plan Keenan had shown him his 27 page ring binder and he'd actually given Keenan a thousand dollars that he said was basically seed money for the kidnapping but he claimed that he thought that you know obviously Keenan had this prescription pill addiction and there's some evidence he might have been suffering from some psychosis so he never thought that he would go through with it but his involvement gave credence to this idea that it was some kind of industry inside job Ultimately, though, Keenan's defence was unsuccessful and he was sentenced to 75 years in prison, of which he only actually served four years. How did that happen? Because you can halve a sentence, can't you? And then you can take a bit more off for good behaviour. But how does 75 become four? Well, I gather that his mental health was under question, not only through the trial itself, but also once he was imprisoned. You know, even to this day, he says... 
To kidnap the son of one of the most famous men in America who was known to have mafia ties is not a sane thing to do. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you discount everyone who's incarcerated in America who committed a crime because they were on drugs, needed drug money and did a slightly mad thing, you wouldn't have many people left, would you? So he still <laughs> seems to have received some sort of special treatment. I mean, regardless, he then got out of prison and went on to have a really successful real estate career, not dissimilar to the plan that he'd set out in the ring binder for which he needed $240,000 as seed money um, and has become a multimillionaire to the tune of $17 million. So he was obviously a person of some capacity behind this slightly crazy scheme. Well, I mean, he earned $17 million through real estate. What could he have earned? Maybe uh, these were properties that should have gone for $100 million. He was like, don't need that. Just need $17 million. <laughs> Just $240,000 yeah. per property, actually. That's fine. That's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> Next time... She also holds the record for the fastest time to eat a hot dog with no hands. <laughs> Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.